Hi, I'm Lena Rao. Welcome to our Ask a VC show. I'm joined today by Danny Reimer, partner at Index Ventures. Welcome, Danny. Thank you. Um, I want to just go into your brief bio a little bit. Um, at Index, you've been there since 2002, so 11 years. Um, you invest in both consumer and enterprise services, and you've led investments in Boku, Etsy, Factual, Flipboard, Nasty Gal, People Per Hour, Sky, among many others. Um, welcome. I'm really excited to have you here. Thank you. Uh, I'm, what I'm curious about is actually you're one of the first VCs we've had on the show that has um, been both in Europe and uh, here in SF, you came to SF um, not too long ago to help, uh, you know, begin indexes and big push into the U.S. Um, but you helped lead their practice in London for some time. So, what's the big difference between the, the VC world here and, uh, you know, across the pond? <laughs> um, so here, I'm considered Euro trash, <laughs> and in Europe, I'm considered American. That's the fundamental difference. Um, both are okay with me. Um, <laughs> I mean, they, they are actually pretty pronounced. So Europe is, a, is, is much more of an up-and-coming geography than Silicon Valley, which is the mecca of what we do. And so you still have uh, a strong uh, con concentration of the best entrepreneurs coming to Silicon Valley, and that will never change. However, um, Europe has a lot of incredible uh, assets. One of them is just the innovation level. You know, there's, there's very little herd mentality in Europe because there is no sort of microcosm ecosystem that everyone can depend upon. So the quality of the concept and the revolutionary disruptive nature of the concept is much greater um, in Europe than, uh, than in the U.S. And then there are also a number of other dynamics. I mean, certainly it's a less sophisticated market. So that means that a lot of the infrastructure and resources that we take for granted out here are still being developed in Europe. Recruiters, lawyers, um, uh, consultants, uh, agencies, PR, marketing, et cetera. That's all on the come. Um, but finally, you have great engineers. And those engineers are loyal to the company uh, with the expectation of ups and downs, because right. it's not like they can sort of jump ship depending on how the company next door is doing and then join them. They're actually there for the long haul of the company, which is a huge advantage. So are you seeing, like in the VC industry, that's changed, it's changed a lot here as well. You know, there's this huge flex of angels and seed stage uh, money coming into the mix. Is that happening um, over in Europe? Is that starting to happen? Certainly, there are, are a lot of initiatives. Actually, one of my partners, Saul Klein, started Seed Camp, which is sort of the Y Combinator of Europe. Uh, that has they're going on to their fourth year now, um, and that certainly has generated some some pretty interesting companies. Every class gets significantly better than the last one, and you have a few angels that are really dedicated to to the market. Um, in fact, sort of the founder of it, we actually brought on board because we felt like we had to do our part. So Robin Klein mm -hmm. um, heads up our, our seed practice. But uh, again, it's much less pronounced than here. Right. Um, there, there, there isn't the clear tiering of different types of folks or groups of folks that you go to for money in Europe in the same way that you have it here. Well, I want to switch over to one of our, our reader questions. Um, sure. and, and this is pretty interesting considering that you have a number of pretty strong companies that have evolved um, in your portfolio. Uh, the question is, how can one uh, understand that a startup has a billion dollars market cap potential You know, when you're seeing it? Um, at a Series A or even the seed stage, um, and, and you know you've seen Dropbox and and some others sort of reach that point. What, what's the sign that you look for? I mean, a lot of it is based on uh, the the entrepreneur and whether the entrepreneur, in fact, really thinks she's going to be able to achieve a billion in market cap. So, how dedicated is she to what she's going after? Um, so, for instance. Uh, an entrepreneur who comes to see me and says he's thinking that this is a great opportunity and if he works for the next 18 months, he's going to be able to sell it to Google, Facebook, or Amazon. That's of no interest to ours uh, because we really want the companies who are 
going to be independent, solid businesses, which means that the IPO route is the most logical route for, for um, an exit or a liquidity event. So a lot has to do with the conviction of the entrepreneur and then truly whether or not the service has the right product market fit to be disruptive so that, that really you look at the market, you look at what they're doing, the size of the market makes sense that you can truly go after something massive and their approach is so differentiated and revolutionary that they're going to capture a big part of the market. Could you give me an example of, of a company that you've seen? I mean, you've been doing this now for 11 years, so what, what's a company that you've seen that you got early and, and ended up doing that, or maybe currently that you think has the potential? Well, I mean, there are, you know, there are, there are a number of companies that, um, you know, it's, it's sort of difficult because the whole premise of index is we don't invest in companies unless they do have that billion dollar opportunity. Right. So it's sort of asking me uh, well, to talk everyone about my favorite is, yeah. child. Um, but that being said, I think that, you know, I'll give you one example of a, of a company where the entrepreneur sort of encapsulated it best in the first meeting that we had, which is Martin Mikos, who was at MySQL, where he came to me, and MySQL is this database, right. open source database, sort of standard now, it's sort of the lingua franca of databases. And the first time he came to me, he said, look, it's very simple. The relational database market is a $9 billion market a year. I want to shrink it to $3 billion and I want to take a third of the market. That works. That hit you, you knew. That, that works because the numbers are true. Right. So the market is massive. Right. He's going to disrupt the actual economy of the market and he's got the conviction to actually take a huge share of that market. Well, I want to uh, switch to a different topic. And he um, achieved it, by the way. So Yes, and know. he did. That's right. So that's that's, that's right. pretty good. Um, E-commerce. You've led investments in Nasty Gal, Etsy, uh, among others. Um, and, you know, e-commerce, I think, is going through a little bit of a shift. You know, we're seeing some of the older models uh, maybe not have as much growth potential as we thought they would. Um, but you've bet on, on some recent e-commerce uh, companies. What's your view on that? So I think the first thing is that actually e-commerce is growing massively. It just happens that the traditional players, I can't believe I'm thinking of Amazon as a traditional player, right. but at this point, you know, uh, they are a traditional player. I think I can say that because that was part <laughs> of the IPO. Um, you know, they are executing so well, and then traditional companies like Office Depot, 42% of their revenue is actually online, which I was pretty shocked about when, when I saw that. So you have traditional players who have made it part of their, their business and see it as integral to what they're doing, and they're doing great. And so the question is, as e-commerce is growing and as the traditional players have woken up or have continued to execute and out-execute everyone like Amazon, how do new players really make a significant dent in that, in that industry? And that's more challenging. So we've gone after fashion because Europe tends to be more aware of fashion, shall I say, than the U.S. <laughs> when I don't, it comes I, to, I, I'm going to, you know, I, I, went, I don't I'm agree with about, that, but. I didn't I'll finish. <laughs> I didn't, uh, you, you clearly have a very clear <laughs> sense of fashion. But what I'm talking about is, you know, designers. I mean, if you look right. at the number of designers That's and you right. know, look at the number of sort of groups like LVMH and PPR and what they represent of the overall fashion um, spend, uh, in relative terms to American companies, there's no comparison. So, so anyway, that was why we got into it in the first place. Um, if you look, so we went after fashion because it's going to end up being about a third of e-commerce from our perspective. It's just going to be massive. It turns out that everyone likes to buy clothes, but women really like to buy clothes. <laughs> um, so, so we've gone after fashion. And our belief is that when it comes to fashion, it's actually not about the business model. Um, it's not about the flash sale or the celebrity endorsement. Guess what? It's about the product. And so the companies that we are really backing and really interested in are those companies that demonstrate that they have a differentiated product and they understand their demographic better than anyone else and therefore they're not going to be challenged in the same way that you are if you're just doing a subscription model or something in a box or celebrity endorsed or flash sale. Any of those business model tweaks, if they work, 
all the traditional players will do it better than, than the new players will. Now, what about like curation and personalization? There, yeah. Those are some sort of buzzwords I feel like that are thrown out when, when, when people are talking about the future of e-commerce. Yeah. Is that part of what, you, what you're envisioning as you know, this, Absolutely. this element of fashion? Absolutely, because really both curation and personalization point towards a direct relationship with the customer and actually enabling the customer to, to demonstrate what they're interested in or follow those people that they're really interested in and whose taste they recognize and, and actually are, are loyal to. Um, so it's really interesting because curation is, is almost as important, if not more important, than creation was for the first phase of the Internet. So the next 10 years of the Internet are really going to be around curation. Um, and you were asking about a company that clearly uh, illustrates this, which is not a portfolio company of ours, but certainly Pinterest is a phenomenal example of that. Right, right. Well, Danny, I really appreciate you coming on the show, and thanks so much. Pleasure.